She's coming. Hey guys, welcome to Homeschool On. This is my mom. I've done some videos with her already, so we're familiar with this, but you aren't. This is my mom, Bonnie, and she's visiting. She's leaving us tomorrow to go back very far away. She doesn't live close to me, and so we're taking yeah. this opportunity to go live and share with you guys just whatever you want to hear. This isn't ask us anything. So you get to ask us anything. I'm going to open it up here so I can see your questions. We are only going to do this as long as the questions are streaming. So if you're not asking questions, we're going to say, hey, see you later because, <laughs> because we all have lives to live, right? That's the thing. So hopefully you guys have some good questions for us. I'm going to make sure I'm muted on this. Oh, there we are. Um, and then we will see questions on the side. Hey, Heather. So I know I didn't give you guys a lot of notice, but if you have questions about homeschooling, so here's the deal. I am a second gen homeschooler. That's what it's called, that's the term. It means that I was homeschooled. This is, my, I'm a second generation <laughs> homeschooler. So I was homeschooled up until halfway through grade 10. Yeah. With little breaks in school here and there. And so if you have questions about my experience being homeschooled, my mom, I am the second oldest of six kids and she has homeschooled all of us at some point or another. So she has 25 plus years of homeschooling behind her. So that is why I say, if you have questions, <laughs> post them. If we don't get to all of your questions, because these are going to move fast once people start typing in, then ask it again. Just copy it is the easiest way and then you can just hit paste and ask again. If we don't get to it, we will look through comments and kind of respond as we have time. So, so bear with us and be patient, but we will do our very best. So one of the questions was, what's your one regret homeschooling? Oh, Are you asking, if you're asking me, I don't really have one. I, I honestly don't. I, I loved it. I, I mean, there were days I didn't love it because there are days for all of us that we don't love what we're doing. But as a whole, I loved it. And I, yeah, it was really positive for me. For me as a, as a woman and as a mom, I found it fulfilling and I found it just great in my relationship with my kids. I don't have a regret. Hmm. Do I have regrets? <laughs> I don't have any regrets with my decision to homeschool. Um, I, I feel like... I have lots of things I wish I did better. <laughs> I feel like I have lots of things I wish yeah, I did that, better. Yeah, in that way, yeah. But but as far as my decision to homeschool, do I, I regret that decision? Absolutely not in any way. And, and my regret as far as being homeschooled, I have not. Being homeschooled for me was the greatest gift that I've perceived growing up. I mean, yeah, I think my parents were awesome parents. I think they were better parents than I am. <laughs> um, but... But for a homeschooling aspect of it, I really see that as the greatest gift. It's a huge sacrifice. I know it's a sacrifice. I'm walking in it. It's a sacrifice. I saw you give up stuff in your life to homeschool us. And so I know that it, it was not a free gift. It cost something. And so I value that so much as somebody who went through it. And I just, I'm so, I see it as, as a foundational stone of who I am. So no regrets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. What would you suggest for a good geography curriculum for a fourth grader? I, I don't use a geography curriculum. I, I'm pretty Charlotte Mason. So my favorite approach is I use homeschool in the woods. They have a map disc. You just print off a map and you just spend a few minutes a day finding things on an atlas and labeling it on a map. The kind of approach I found from Teaching From Rest by Sarah McKenzie is that you find three things and you, you find it in an atlas and you label it on your map, whether you're working on countries, whether you're working on your state or states of the US or your provinces, and then the next day you try to remember those and then you add a couple more. And so you're building on what you, what you know is just very gentle. I don't know if you need an entire new curriculum just for geography. Yeah, I didn't do a lot of geography actually till grade five. I didn't really do a, so, a formal social studies program with any of the kids because we focused on reading and writing and arithmetic. Who remembers geography anyways, you guys? But, but other people that I know did missionary projects. So where their friends were as missionaries or where other people lived and looking that up and finding it on the map, doing map studies, just when you go on a trip, Helping, letting the kids, I do that with actually Hannah. I still have one at home. And she can follow it 
on her phone now because of the technology. But um, just those kinds of things, because it's, it's not so much about what you know about every country as much as it is, I think, about being able to find out and find it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I, I honestly, joke, joke aside, really, what do you remember about geography? Like people here, I'm from Canada and they're like, do you have big like, People don't remember stuff. We don't remember stuff. What you do remember is what you've experienced. Yeah. So make yeah. geography part of your life. When you go somewhere, whether you've got really young kids, make geography part of, okay, we're going to the store. Let's figure out the map and which direction are we going? Make it, bring it in. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with if you're going on any sort of a road trip, get your kids to map it before and, and identify as you go because that is what they will remember. They're not going to necessarily remember the little things they memorized. I mean, they might. We can hope, right? Yeah, we can hope. <laughs> I learned more than... than uh, that I got to relearn. That's one of the benefits of homeschooling, I think, is that all the things that you you were taught but you didn't really get, you get when you get to teach it to your kids. And then it's like, now you value, I feel like now I value education so much more. Yeah. So I'm going through it and I'm like, there's, this is, you guys, isn't this amazing? Like, isn't this amazing we get to learn? And they're like, yeah, no, this, this, <laughs> this isn't. is really exciting. <laughs> not sure my enthusiasm because I get to relearn it. So anyways. What was your favorite part about homeschooling for you and my favorite part of being homeschooled? My favorite part of homeschooling, that's a, that's a little bit tough because the time with my kids was incredible. I loved the time. Um, but I think it was when I got, I, it would take work sometimes, a lot of work, and other times it just came to me. But you, you get an idea and suddenly you know how to take that idea and make it click over here. And you you get this, I don't know, brain boost, whatever. And you you see the light come on because you go, I got it. I, I have a way to paint the picture for you or to explain this to you. And you do it and they go, aha. And they have those aha moments. I think that was my favorite was those aha moments. Yeah, and that's totally what I, in exact terminology, I was going to say, <laughs> the aha moments, not for being homeschooled, I have to think about that one for a second, but for myself homeschooling, yeah. when it clicks, there's, when when it clicks, it, I can't imagine, I, I seriously can't imagine somebody else taking that from me. Like, it's just, I'm, I'm teaching my kids to read, I hate teaching my kids to read, it's painful, but yeah. when they actually read and it gets to fluency, it's like, it, and they're proud of themselves and you were a part of that and you got to experience that with them there's a bond that happens in that that I don't want anyone to take from me or the worst thing is I imagine a class of 30 kids and no one would even be able to share that experience with them no one's even gonna know it's 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 not celebrated the same way it can be in homeschool and I just I love it it doesn't go unnoticed yeah, yeah it doesn't take yeah it. that is definitely and it. for being homeschooled for sure it was it was well for sure, for sure, Ooh, double, because it was relationships, the relationships I have with my siblings and my parents, I completely attribute to being homeschooled. But I think the space and the freedom to be who I was, good, bad, and ugly, to grow and develop at my own pace, to follow my interests and my passions, to, um, to, to just, just grow without restraint, I feel like, was what homeschooling mm -hmm. was for me. And I think that was the greatest gift out of it. I mean, I graduated early. Some people may look and say, well, see, homeschooling for you is that you were academically well-prepared and you were only 16 and, you know, but who cares whether I graduated when I was 16 or whether I graduated when I was 18. What I see from it was so much more than education. It was me as a person and the development that I got as a person mm -hmm. in my confidence and my strengths and my passions and, you know, it, the, that, that confidence of... Yeah, being okay to just just figure out who I was. Yeah, have a bad day. Be grumpy. Your kids yeah. can be grumpy. You can be grumpy. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not maybe okay, but <laughs> all right. Rachel wants to know what would you do differently. Um, you know, I started out fairly focused on Bible stuff, and I continued that fairly steady throughout but as the kids got older I did focus more on academics and getting them prepared to go to school especially for their grade 11 and 12. Um, I think what I would do differently is be more consistent with the Bible teaching mm -hmm. and I I 
and 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 having it allowing the kids to um experience god and taught god more because my girls because they were the oldest and then the boys came i didn't do near as much bible stuff with my boys um i did with josh he he was willing to talk lots and we worked and talked together about stuff but my other ones i i kind of assumed they had gotten it when i really taught it to my older kids and they were quite a bit younger and that's probably the one thing that I would do different because for me that was their greatest equipping and I equipped them I think well in a lot of different areas but it's probably the one area that I could have done more in hmm. and and my sister one of my sisters homeschooled she was older than me um, that when she spoke to Jessica about it she said that was her chief regret is that she she didn't teach her kids enough about who God was, but who they were. And, and just seeing the, the big picture of, of what God can do and that he's interested in every little detail of their lives. Yeah, that's good. That's, I, I had no idea. Wow, well, okay. Um, what was your style of homeschooling? Do you know all the different styles, though? <laughs> Are we teaching? Yeah, you can teach me. You uh, study Montessori, uh, traditional, Charlotte Mason. Okay, well, Charlotte Mason wasn't around way back then, even. How do you like that? Well, yeah, it, like, Charlotte Mason is old, like dead, actually. So I feel like <laughs> um, we did unit studies. Um, yeah. We did book studies. Uh, we Konos. did some of those. Yeah, Konos. <laughs> we only did Konos really maybe twice maybe three times because I, I have some of our old unit studies i'm hiding mm -hmm. downstairs like, yeah yeah the book study um i i really liked those for accents for one of the things i and we talked about this in curriculum curriculum is just your tool so i used can i say what i used yes <laughs> okay because i used a becca for my math and English. I also used it for science, but only as a tool. We did very little, until the kids got lots older, grade five and six, we really didn't answer the questions in it. I used it as my resource um, because I loved the bright, colorful pictures. I liked the flow of it. So for me, I needed that, that constant and that I knew that I was gonna cover stuff from here to there. But again, I didn't use every unit within that book. It was mine to use. Um, and sometimes I would take some of the units out of the grade four, Abeka, and some out of the grade five, because that's what I wanted to cover that year. And, and so I, it was my tool. Um, but I, I did, for social studies, until grade five, I really didn't do anything formal. Um, and then I did the Canadian one of Abeka, because we're from Canada. And then we did added some other things in, but then we didn't do it till you guys, we did a co-op together for the rest of the stuff for social studies. Um, a lot of life stuff, reading books, um, uh, how Canada forms government, we did that one year just as a book. So, and, and for geography, literally it was like, okay, we're driving to Oregon or we're going to Calgary and these are the provinces and, it was it was pretty informal as far as that, so I kind of was a eclectic. Yeah, and I, I I did the unschooling, but the things that that I needed this I needed the framework for were math and English, and I really didn't vary from them, but I could make them work for whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there was traditional aspects in in our homeschooling, specifically with Abeka because Abeka is a much more traditional program. But but yeah, I think that you were way better at the, the especially, like I still remember the medieval, the medieval <laughs> unit we did and we all dressed up and we all like, we studied it first, we got books about it, like very kind of unschooling child directed, but a unit study where we did all sorts of different things around that or our Heidi or our like different, we went camping for that one. Yeah. And I remember those things. So you were really good at making these like, like we would focus on something for like a month and there was like so much put into it yeah. it wasn't just read and write yeah so very little writing because i i'm not a writer i 
for, she got it from her dad. Um, <laughs> Because he can write, you put a pen in my hand. I said to my pastor once, I said, you put a pen in my hand and, and I, I can't even think. And my mind goes blank. He goes, oh, let's do that at the next board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I had too many thoughts. But um, yeah, it was, I, I wanted, I needed it to be that. So then I, it was easier for me to create that for my kids. How can I convince my husband that homeschool is a good choice? Just tie him up in a chair and yeah. show him a bunch of homeschooling videos. He'll be convinced. No. <laughs> that one's tough because we, I mean, we, I don't know your husband. Um, but but I, think, I think part of the issue is, is not letting them be involved. I, I really do. I think that sometimes we, because they're kind of not for us, or I had that with some family. Some family was great. Some family was not. Um, but I think looking back, if I had been more willing to say, so I'm trying to create this and I could use some input from you. When they become part of it, I think it may help. But again, I'm, I'm speaking from not knowing anything really about you or where you're coming from or what's there. Yeah, I would recommend, I mean, when you're trying to convince your husband on the outset that homeschooling is even a good idea, prayer like pray because yeah. really like you can't you can't force somebody to be where they're not yeah. the other thing is is being aware of the fact like even when you you'll find that if, if you do convince him if, if you do it for a year just even saying well, listen why don't we I understand your concerns validate the fact they have concerns they're not sure um, say are you willing to let me try this and and then you are gonna have to be aware that you have to prove to them a little bit I, I talk a lot about other people's expectations and judgments and, and opinions and preconceived notions and how we take that on as weight. With most other people, my own strategy is ignore them because I don't care what the cashier thinks and, and constantly telling myself it doesn't matter what their opinion is. Anyone that is outside of my immediate family, it really does not matter. Your in-laws, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles, it doesn't matter what they think, right? But with your husband, it does. It greatly matters what he thinks and if he's with you or not. And so being aware of the fact that you did not come to the decision to homeschool. You didn't come to your philosophy of education overnight. You watched videos, you read blog posts, you did all this research that slowly reading these books has changed your perception of education and given you this desire and this heart and this calling to homeschool. Your husband has not done all that. And so you need to give him grace and time and proof and respect him to, to kind of give him the space to get there because he's not going to get there on his own. And he's also not going to get there overnight and see everything you see because you invested time to get to that. And also maybe validating what his real concerns are because my husband was right on board with homeschooling. He thought it was great. But when I wanted to branch out to some other things in other ways, he had a hard time because he didn't want it to take away from something specific that he wanted out of me and needed to, to receive out of me. And so maybe there's some specific concerns that he has that he says, okay, well, if you homeschool, this is going to change and that's going to change. And those things are really important to me. So finding out where his concerns really lie and also introducing him maybe to some other homeschool families might be a good idea. Might not be. <laughs> All right, um, okay, for my mom, Susanna wants to know, did you feel your kids missed out on social interaction? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna check the water. Okay. I'm gonna let you talk about this for a second. My, my husband and I are both fairly social. We were involved in a church, um, and I come from a large family, um, so, we just created a lot of environments for our kids to have social interaction. Um, they, we went to an old folks home once a month. Um, they helped me with Sunday school stuff. We got together with other homeschool families and I know that that's hard sometimes. Sometimes it was just one other family for part of our season. Another time it was a fairly significant group. When the kids got older, they were involved in youth. but. But I think socially, they were far beyond um, where kids that go to school are because they're only able to identify with their peers. And my kids could talk to any adult, any senior, and any child. Like they were comfortable, they were comfortable in their skin 
and they felt like they had something to offer. And I, I talked about this in one of our things, but you know, we emphasize so much in this generation um, that we have to value our kids and make sure they are valued. And we do a lot to reinforce our kids and, and tell them how special they are, how important they are, how valued they are. But words are good and they're important, but they don't do it all. And when we allow them to experience things and they get to see that they make an impact on the world and on others' lives, they gain a confidence that you can't get from just words. Yeah. No, that's very true. That's good. I love it. And I'm not going to add anything, which is miraculous, you guys. <laughs> I always have something to add. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Did you ever feel like you were failing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm human. <laughs> um, I, I did. I felt, especially sometimes after a homeschool convention, because I thought, oh, they're doing all these things, and there's so much there. It's because you didn't come to my session. <laughs> yeah. I talk a lot about my failings. <laughs> but, but, um, but for the most part in the year, I, I loved my teaching, and I was, very, I was very confident. I don't quite know where I got that from, because I, I, I think it was a God thing, actually, because he, he had called me to it, and, and I just saw growth in my kids, and that's really what I wanted, and so... I saw the achievement, even even if they were struggling in uh, an academic course for uh, years. <laughs> um, it still was, I still saw progress, and their development as people was huge. And so so I think sometimes we, we take in too much, or we compare ourselves too much. And homeschooling wasn't uh, maybe as big as it is now. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't have as many people to compare myself to. And I didn't have all this online stuff to, to say, oh, well, I do this and sit there and go, well, I don't. Should I be doing that? Mm, maybe. Yeah. And, and so that, that was an advantage for me. And yet this is awesome that you can see what else is out there and give you opportunities. So yeah. it's kind of a two, double-edged sword. You gotta have your you gotta have your lens on. You gotta put on I talk about taking off the lens, but you gotta put on the lens. You gotta put on the lens of who you are, who your kids are, what you are called to do when you look at everything. Because conversation is great. Talking with other homeschool moms and social media is fantastic because like my mom said, it gives you this you can see inside something Attention. else and you can see different viewpoints and perspectives and it's amazing, amazing, so valuable and worth it. But you know, if, if we as homeschool moms are as actually humans, humanity. We love to convince everyone to be where we are. So when we find a curriculum, and there's some people that are really, really good at this. They find curriculum and they are just like, you, have you heard, have you heard about this curriculum? It's life changing, it's gonna change your life, everything's gonna be different, it is the answer. And they're so convincing that you feel like, well clearly what I'm using is not that. I don't feel that kind of passion, so I need to try it. But there's this element of, I'm not saying it might not be the best for you, but put on the lens. Is that where you wanna go? Is that how you value success? Is that matching up with your goals? Is that gonna work for your own kids and your own situation? And, and so a warning for us when we're hearing and comparing, but also a warning for those of us that are sellers. I'm a seller. I love selling people on, on my life, what I'm using, what I'm doing, but I'm learning to more and more listen. As homeschool moms, when we're getting together, we want to support and encourage one another, listen to where other people are at, and, and support and encourage, listen first, and then you can give your opinions and your advice and say, you know, that may work for you, that may not, I don't know, it's hard, why don't we pray together? Those are the kind of things that is not just my answer or, or the highway, and learning to just be more more aware that it isn't just your world yeah. kind of thing. And your your lens really is your mission statement. Why are you homeschooling and what do you want to get out of it? And that changes year to year. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, as far as me, I feel like I'm failing all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's because I actually am failing. <laughs> there are some days that I'm like, this day, let's just write that off and try again tomorrow. And I'm so thankful for mornings. I'm so thankful for grace. And do you, if you want to scroll through and find another one, and then you can say it while I'm talking. Okay. Um, and, and you know, like you have that, you have that new opportunity tomorrow, the new day. And so don't go to bed when you feel that 
I'm a failure. There's something about owning that. I think we make mistakes. We're, we're human. And so when you make a mistake saying, yeah, today sucked. I had a terrible attitude. I was sick. I was tired. Um, I, I should have done everything differently. Everything from start to finish. But, but don't let that stay on you. That guilt really, uh, that's the enemy. And those are the lies that, that even if there's truth in that, he's going to hold that over you, hold that over you, hold that over you. And so just saying, okay, yeah, I sucked. I'm human. Too bad. I'm going to go to bed and then I'm going to reset tomorrow. Hit that reset button and I'm going to pray and I'm going to try again. And so I think owning it sometimes, own that whole failure thing, learn from your mistakes, move forward. Don't stay in that guilt and that, you know, pressure. Yeah. Um, this just it keeps jumping. So fast, yeah, it's just like, well, how do I but find you, it? You found one? No. <laughs> so uh, one was saying, <laughs> I'm not technological at all. I scroll and it jumps and I'm thinking, did I did this do that? <sighs> Anyways, the, somebody had said something about the fear of starting out homeschooling. And Sarah, this um, is you. <laughs> so um, God has not given you a spirit of fear. And if you're feeling called to it, step out. But also just enjoy it. And, and it may only be for a season. And... And have a confidence in who you are and that you can do this. I don't know how old your kids are or, you know, if they're just beginning, so you're beginning. Believe me, you really can teach kindergarten, grade one, two, three, four, even five. We're all smarter than a fifth grade, uh, <laughs> supposedly. Um, but but just if God's calling it and it, it is something that's stirring in your heart, then just take that on and allow... Allow your God-given instincts and and mom heart to to guide you. I think hmm. books for people starting out or thinking about homeschooling. Um, for Christian, and I haven't read it yet. I have it downstairs. But I would look at if you are thinking about starting, you're on the outside of it. You're not looking for homeschool support encouragement. You're looking for should I do this? Um, Education. Does God have an opinion? By Israel Wayne. I would check that out. I have heard rave reviews about it and it's going to help you from a Christian perspective decide, um, yeah, is, is, does God even have an opinion on this? What is his opinion? And so I would check that one out would be my recommendation. Um, how to homeschool high school. I have nothing. My kids are in elementary, so <laughs> defer, defer. Um, so I did put my kids in for grade 11 and 12. Um, Hannah, Becca, sorry, my youngest is Hannah. I confused them all the time. We all do it. Um, Rebecca went for halfway through grade 10 as well. But um, I, they had already finished a number of, homes, of high school things and written departmentals already for them. So um, I did it together with another two moms. Um, one was a scientist, so it was awesome to do science with her. But we also did a so, the social studies, the grade 11 um, BC Ministry Social Studies program and we did it with three families and my husband helped teach physics I just pulled him in when we did biology I loved it because I I organized all the experiments and somebody else did all the teaching and I did all the grading it was awesome um, but we did it together because especially for some of the older grades it's really nice for the kids to be able to bounce off each other mm -hmm. so the things that I did when the kids were older um, I think they benefited from that. And we met once a week, and then I lined out all the homework the kids had to do. She taught, and I laid out all the homework, and then that's what they worked on as their own seat work during the week. But they got together, do experiments, have some class teaching, do those kinds of things. And I think that was very beneficial, and it was important for me. Hmm. Um, homeschooling different age groups. Okay, so for elementary, so if I were looking at your kids, I would probably teach, other than my seat work, because I did math and, uh, math and language, they had their own books to work on. But socials and Bible and all of those things, I kind of took the oldest couple of kids, that was Becca and Jess, I took their curriculum, I taught it, and then those things, she would have to do some of the schoolwork. Jessica would have to do more of the schoolwork. Joshua would maybe have to do a little bit of it, but I would break it down into, okay, I want you to find these things or do these things or look on a map for this. And John just had to listen because I had four of them at that point. 
all in that, you know, grades one to grade five kind of thing, or grades one to grade six. And so, so yeah, the expectation, and John, he started participating with school when he was four. So did she. Um, Jessica was starting grade one, and she was four. Jess was six. And she learned to read at the same time as Jess, and she really pushed herself to just stay right with Jess. She was not going to get left behind. Um, but but it was it was kind of that that whole um, thing, and and just setting expectations. So yeah, know your kids, know your kids, know their learning styles, know how they fit together. Some of your kids are going to blend, some are oil and water. So which ones are those, and which ones can you blend together? Age is not as important as that blending factor. Some personalities and learning styles yeah. work really well. So teaching together, they do, we even do language arts together. We even do math together. I purchase math. I find kids that are behind in math, kids that are ahead in math. Great, we're going to do math together. So I blend everything. Um, is what we do. We blend language arts. We do it all as a family. Um, and so that works really well for me with, with the way that I'm doing it right now, because, because there's five of them that I'm all trying to do school with. They're all young. They all need my help. So I, I the ping pong thing was making me not breathe. And so I decided that breath was important. Um, <laughs> but you know, so, so blending your kids, but have your older kids teach your younger ones too. Yeah, I taught that's, yeah. Kate, Matt, uh, John, not my own kids. I did teach John. Yes, my brother. Yeah. Um, I did school with him. I did science with him. I loved it. I was such a little teacher that it, it appealed to me. I learned through it. And so have your older kids teach your younger whenever possible. And then double check on what they're learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you can also use that, that same type of approach. But you just think about how much you learn in teaching your kids. So having them reiterate it, half the time they didn't even need to, they could answer the questions but writing it down wasn't as important as them being able to teach it. I knew they had it when they could teach it to somebody else. And so that was a good, that was a good uh, measuring stick for me as to how much they had retained of, of uh, what I had taught. All right, curious. I feel like I know her answer. So we've done a series of videos, you guys. They're going to be coming up because she's going home. But the goodness doesn't stop here. So we have a series of videos about curriculum, um, organization, um, making your mission statement mission statement and just kind of our story and our experiences with being homeschooled and homeschooling so those are all kind of shorter little clips that you can watch without having to sit here for an hour because you're busy so those are going to be coming up on youtube and probably here on facebook so stay tuned but somebody asked about do you think it is better to have a schedule or fly by the seat of your pants for me i needed the schedule uh, we did one on this on yes we did organization um, so I had, I had three main things. Let's see if I can remember them, um, for organization. Organization isn't so much having a list. I like lists. I like to cross them all off, but it isn't so much about having a specific list of things to do as much as it is of having a plan. And if you, my, my quote was, if you fail to plan, you plan on failing. And and, and to have that plan, that looks different for each one of us. Even people who fly by the seat of their plants ha pants have a plan, a, a general plan. It's just they, they get more interrupted as they're going because squirrel. <laughs> um, but, but sometimes they accomplish more. But not having a plan, not having anything, we, we are also setting our kids up, I think, for failure because we're not teaching them. And, and you paved the way, and so I think that that's really important to have, a, to have a plan and to have some sort of thing. I also did a, a plan for each of my kids, and Sunday nights I wrote out what I thought when they were younger. This is what you do with these pages in math. This is what you have to work on for spelling words. This is what you have to do for this is why language. she was a better homeschool mom This than is me. What you have, how much you have to read. But as they got older, I expected them to do that. And so it, it helped formulate them setting goals and plans and achievements. And it, it just made my life so much simpler for me because I really needed the, the thing. I needed it to cross off so that I felt like I'd accomplished something. And, and although my husband never looked at my list, I felt like if he ever wanted to, he would see all I had done. <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah, sometimes you need to see it. For me, I love to plan. I love to make lists. I don't follow through at all. And so, and because I'm a perfectionist, all or nothing fatalist, then sometimes plans have backfired on me. So I make a schedule for my homeschool. I make a schedule for what we're going to do. Things happen. I get busy. I can't do it. And then I feel like it's all garbage and I feel like I wasted my time, which is a huge value to me is that I, I time, I, I hate wasting my time. So because I have found that actually planning out what we're going to do, our school subjects, what days we're going to do, it does not work for me because we inevitably won't do those things. And then I feel like a total failure and I will just do nothing because we're already behind. So what's the point? It's all, it's all over for this week. Let's just try again next week. So for me, I still take the time to write. I still take the time to think big picture goals. I still take the time to get out what's in my head on paper. And that helps me to have an overview. I do more fly by the seat of my pants. Um, but I still take that time. I think that the planning process is important. It also helps you identify priorities because yes. when you're writing out the list, then you'll suddenly go, Oh shoot. I've got to make sure that one fits in. And it, and it just kind of, like you said, that brain dump, helps you and then you sit there and go, right, this one is important, we can't miss this. Yeah, yeah, so different, different personalities, yeah. um, different styles, different needs in your homeschool. So I think for some people the answer is they do need to plan and that helps them feel more on top of things and it helps them kind of make sure that they're staying on track. For other people, it doesn't work but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take the time to just kind of write out your big picture goals and ideas of what you wanna see for your homeschool. So. I use a schedule, I actually do make schedules, but I use those to create routines for myself because I can figure out how completely unrealistic my expectation is when I make a schedule and I see it's ridiculous. It's like, wow, there's not even enough hours in the day for me to do what I actually expect and hope to achieve. So then I can cross things off and I can be more realistic because I'm very unrealistic. And then I can plug those things into a routine and find a rhythm for our day, not what we're gonna do, what subject, what, what pages, but a rhythm for our day because I took that time to plan. So it's different looks, yeah. but I think they're both really valid. There yeah. isn't a right answer, you guys. Yeah. You find you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And to, to have the freedom to do you. Yeah. Have, it really, that's really important. So this one, what's this one? Um, my seven-year-old is reading a five-year-old level. Okay, so we have two questions about reading. So let's just talk about reading a little bit. Somebody else had said that um, they, they, their kids are seven, I think, and maybe behind. It's a real struggle for them. And it is your greatest value is that they learn how to read. And so you just, you're really struggling with this one that they're not getting it. And what do we have for tips to help? Um, so I'll let my mom start and then I will. She'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had, I mean, she read really early and reading was really important to me because it's how, it's how you're going to learn as an adult. But I, I didn't ask my son, but I'm confident he won't care if I share this. He didn't read, it, even by grade four, he wasn't reading. And he struggled, um, he had a mild form of dyslexia, not one that was diagnosed, but I could tell. Um, and it was, it was there, and yet I knew he was bright, but it was like, I mean, even if you gave him sentences, the cat ran, um, I don't know, what's another? Up three the hill. Up the hill, yeah. Three, you know, all three letter words are shorter. He would read, the, uh, uh, at, and he never did put it together. So it was like that every time he read it, he was grade four. I just, I thought, oh my word. I mean, look at these two, have, the two girls had gone on before. And, and he labored through it. Spelling helped him actually, um, doing some spelling things. But I didn't push him a whole lot because it was so overwhelming for him. And math, he was a whiz at. He passed this girl in math at those younger grades. Um, but, but he got there. And he's, he is an engineer. So don't sweat it too much. And, and if it's overwhelming them, I don't know, maybe find some fun ways of them reading. What made the difference for him is he got to grade 7 and Lord of the Rings came out for the first time, and he wanted to read The Hobbit. <laughs> I kind of chuckled inside me. We got it for him for Christmas. We bought him The Hobbit. It's this big, thick book, and he read it. And he had enough foundation, and before then, he didn't even want to read a comic book. And so, so that was huge for him. 
and and they do get there and unless you're suspecting that there is something bigger going on sometimes it's just plain old developmental and a reason you know you get these kids that are so pragmatic that they kind of need a reason why they're doing something not just do it for the sake of doing it they're just not there that's mm -hmm. that isn't there um so rebecca flew ahead in reading but she struggled more in math and um we did extra math and we tried other things and i probably at this point wouldn't push the same as i pushed her but her personality was such that she could do it so. <laughs> I think, I mean, so similar, it's a very similar story to Malachi's grade four. He is, he is sounding out, he's reading it probably more of a grade, well, Aaliyah is grade two, well, she's grade one. She's ahead, so she's doing grade two work and reading at a grade two level, and he is behind at grade four working at about a grade two level. So in my opinion, take it as a win because, hey, I can blend my kids, yay. Um, so they, yeah. they work together a lot. And, and so he's, he's two years behind in his reading. So is my daughter. She's two years behind in her reading. I've got some kids ahead, some kids behind. That dynamic through time has given me confidence that they will get there, like my mom said. I've seen them get there. And Caleb got there. He, he was similar to me and he kind of taught himself to read. It wasn't working for us. It was such a struggle. And then he picked up a book and read in the beginning, God created, I mean, big words. You can't go from three letter words to that. There's no reason he could do that other than it clicked in his head. There is a certain number of times you have to read where it's, it's less about, you don't actually have to learn all the blends. Your brain is not actually sounding everything out. It is memorizing. It, it, it gets these strategies in place that it's just, it sees it, it knows. It sees it, it knows. That's why those little, those memes that go around with the words all switched and it's amazing. How can I read this? Because your brain is actually, it's more about deciphering than it is about actually sounding out reading. We yes, use phonics to help teach our brain, but that isn't actually how we are reading. Yes. So, so identifying that, realizing that it's actually going to come when it comes. Don't, don't say, oh, well, I'll just give up then. Let's just never read because he's not developmentally ready. I think practice is important. But if we make it so, so negative, listen, if, ki if kids are not developmentally ready, we bog them down so much with that pressure, with writing or with reading. This, this speaks to both that they are, for example, they're trying to write, they're crying because they, they don't even have the tools. They don't have the spelling. They don't have the confidence to be able to write. So they can't think of words. You can't expect them to write something that actually makes sense, is interesting, is funny, because they're so bogged down with the mechanics of it. It's the same with writing You're, or with reading. Your kids are so bogged down with the mechanics. K at they're trying so hard this is a space this is a new word to decipher that to do what's expected of them that then when you expect them afterwards to what happened in the story they have no idea they have no idea because they're so bogged down with the mechanics yeah. josh couldn't even after he had decoded each word in that sentence the cat ran up the hill even if he'd read it three times decoded it three times you still couldn't say what was the sentence about because all he knew was that he was sounding out the words and it, it was just like it was just words. It didn't, it didn't flow. It wasn't part of a story. It was, it was nothing for him. And it was very frustrating for me because I didn't have that with any of my other kids, like none of them, not, not any, but, but when it did click all those things put together. But when I look back, I think spelling helped him mm -hmm. because, and I didn't give him a lot of words, but he was smart. He knew the meaning of words, but just giving him some spelling words, but I didn't always make him just write out word after word after word because writing was also like hard for him. All my boys have terribly messy writing. Hmm? Uh, like, oh, anyways, but, um, but yeah, that was, that's a big thing. Yeah. So be encouraged. I think a, a little bit of that pressure sometimes from us needs to come off consistency, mm -hmm. but, but focusing more, I read a lot to my kids. And so, like, for example, Malachi, who's so behind, so overwhelmed with reading, when we read, sometimes I'll say, you read this paragraph, I'll read the rest of the page. Or you read this page, I'll read this page. Um, so that he can also capture the story because it pulls him in. Because reading is not interesting otherwise because he's so bogged down with the mechanics of it that he's overwhelmed. Whereas when I can bring him into the story, I use funny voices and I stand up and we act it out. Now he's interested in the story. It's much more interesting to read that sentence or that paragraph. It's not so overwhelming. So we still practice it, but, but focusing more on comprehension and reading and, and giving him space and time to get there in his development. 
a mom of a three-year-old and newborn wanting to homeschool preschool. So I would say just have fun and do lots of reading together, coloring, exploring the world, the grass, bugs, snakes, all those things. That is huge for education because then they find in you already the joy of learning with you yeah. and, and make it, make it part of your day and part of the joyful thing. Um, yeah. I think, a... I think that, um, there's two camps and this always happens. This happens with, I, I could list you 20 different ways. This happens in the homeschool world, but, but specifically with preschool and kindergarten, you have, you have good ideas and thoughts that have people taken to extremes. You have the extreme of you should do, you should, you know, you need to do preschool, you need to do kindergarten, you need to give your kids a strong foundation. By kindergarten, they should know their letters and sounds already so that now you can move into reading because kids are expected to read in kindergarten. Expectations have moved up and they weren't that way back in the beginning. Kindergarten was mostly play and learning your letters is changed. The game has changed. So you have the people that are like, we need to give our kids a, a head start. They're gonna be behind if we don't start now. And, and that is taken from a real thing that's happening in our culture today. Then you have the other camp that has taken it completely to the extreme of, well, some kids aren't ready. You know, this has been linked to ADD. This has been linked to this. We're seeing problems when we're pushing kids and putting them in the classroom and telling them to sit quietly. So therefore, you should never do any school with your child until they're six. Because if you do it before then, you're actually setting them up for failure. You're harming your kids. And so you have the people that judge, the people that judge, the people that do nothing, the people that judge the people that do everything and so you in the middle are kind of like well what is the answer the answer is follow your child yeah follow your child listen I've got some kids that I did nothing not a thing not a thing not a thing not one tiny piece of school we explored we had discussions they just lived life and they did great and we started at six yeah. and I had other kids that are keen and so following them my daughter wanted to I'm not gonna say no to her she wants a worksheet there's on Pinterest have a worksheet you know do something quietly she loved it so and and now I have one my five-year-old some days she loves it and wants to do it and then probably 60 70 percent of the time I don't feel like it and I say okay because she's five it's okay you have yeah. time so yeah. follow the lead of your child and your own intuition and discernment don't follow what everyone else is telling you yeah yeah that's that is really important um, we should do maybe like one or two more and then wrap so um somebody uh, gail you put on here that she has a memory problem one of my sons did too um and he had the wiggles oh my word he could not sit still that was just like you know it was just like this all the time so we did a lot of his memory work he did with bouncing a ball um you know, repeating his math facts while he bounced two plus two is eight. Or he loved to skateboard, so he would skateboard and jump and repeat things because the activity of it actually, it was like it was the bouncing of the ball was just formulating in there. Uh, Bible memory, same thing. He needed to do it with an activity and that worked really well. Um, if, if they're girls, Boys like to skip too, but not all the boys wanted to skip. Mine didn't so much, unless they could do it really, really fast. Um, but anyways, doing it with skipping, making things up and having a physical activity is a great way to, to do memorization because not all of us memorize and just reading something over and over is really a difficult way to memorize. Putting it to music. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, music ones out there for your Look math facts. Diddy bugs. Diddy Bugs has all sorts of different things put to music, but yeah, math facts, math rap yeah. CDs. I still remember yeah. those. Yeah. But two times two is four. And then they have a blank. There's like two tracks. One has the answer and then one doesn't have the answer. Right. Two yeah. times two is, and then they have to say it. So yeah. So those were good ones. Bible memory. There's a ton of uh, verses put to music. I um, mean, Steve Green. Yes. Hide there? them in your heart. Hide them in your heart. I grew up Great with that. Um, so Here yeah. a friend. A friend who sticks. I still remember them. Jonathan's like, what are you doing? I'm like, you, you didn't grow up. Like this. That's weird. <laughs> Poor you. <laughs> Anyways, so that's good. Yeah. 
All right, so I know there's gonna be a billion more questions. I see we're dropping off because who sticks with us for a whole hour? Actually, if anyone stuck with us for the whole hour, let's see you. Put your, put your hands up in, in the comments because I think that is quite, quite amazing. It hasn't quite been an hour, but I know it's long and I know you guys have your own homeschool days that you need to go and get to. And so we're gonna wrap it up. If you have more questions, I'm sure there are some here. We are gonna look through the comments as we can and kind of respond. And otherwise, we're gonna let you guys go. So I hope you have an amazing, amazing yeah. homeschool week and, and find your rhythm and routine and the answers for yourself not necessarily everyone else, and be encouraged. Yeah. We're a testament, a testament that you can actually do this and one day look back and love this and see this as just, just such a treasure in your life. Yeah. And you can have your kids go through this, even with the times we fought, which we fought. We fought. Yeah, it wasn't always beautiful. We're very alike. And so when you have a child that's very much like you, it's difficult sometimes. And so, especially as I got older and we were trying to, you know, I'm becoming my own person and push back. And I mean, it was, it was not always easy, but yet I don't look back with all of this negativity and all of this, you know, victimized. I don't, I look back on it as such a gift. She didn't give up on me. She pushed through those difficult times. And so I encourage you when you're looking at this and my kid's going to be weird. Am I weird? <laughs> No, not terribly. I'm <laughs> just sorry. No, she's not. I encourage you guys. This is possible. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Take a deep breath. Breathe. Pray. Find the answers for you. If you have other questions, please post them here. Share this video. If you know anyone that needs some encouragement. And otherwise, we will talk to you again soon. And it's going to be on for a few seconds while I hit the goodbye button. <laughs> there you go. See you guys. Bye-bye.